This is a roll of tape. It's unused. I think I've had this roll for five, maybe six years. And it's not that I haven't needed to use this roll. It's just that when I have, I can never really find where it starts. You know what I'm talking about? Turn it around and maybe you do find the start and you can't really get your nail under it, so you're picking and picking away. And then you got it. But it's really just one of those tape shards. Like, great, what am I gonna do with this? So now you're furiously picking away at it. And maybe you do get it started, right? And you're tugging away. But now a new problem arises. You gotta tear a piece off. And now, you know this isn't gonna work, but you try it anyway, right? So now you gotta go to the kitchen and find a pair of scissors. And you gotta cut this piece off and throw it away because you can't use it. If you are anything like me, you want to give up on that roll fairly quickly. But you've got a lot of boxes to pack. Hi, I'm Callie Collins, and as an architectural designer, I use tape a lot. Recently, though, I learned how to conquer those very difficult roles, like that one. For the last six years, I studied architecture at Thomas Jefferson University. Now, I, know, I have known I wanted to be an architect since I was five years old, since I could hold a pencil, really. And because of this, I set very high expectations for myself. What I did not expect, however, is how difficult of a program architecture really would be. And so by my third year, I had grown so frustrated, so exhausted, that my work started to regress. I wanted to give up, but my advisor suggested that I instead take my time through the program. We devised a plan for me to take less than the recommended amount of courses per year and to defer an extra semester to after graduation. I hated that plan. Not because it wasn't a good idea, it was. I hated it because it meant admitting to myself and to my peers that I couldn't keep up, that I sucked at using tape, <laughs> that I failed. I felt like I needed to prove myself. So for my extra semester, instead of taking classes like yoga or knitting, I decided to produce a thesis on machine learning. One caveat, though. I'm not a computer scientist. Art and design come more naturally to me than computation and logic. And if anybody needs further proof of that here today, it was actually during this extra semester that I learned you're not supposed to save files to your desktop. <laughs> no, I know, I know. I normally get one of two reactions to that statement. What? You should know not to save files to your desktop. Or, what? You should know not to save files to your desktop? <laughs> well, I fell into the latter half of those reactions. So I have to ask my past self, what made me think that someone who lacked the most fundamental understanding of computer science could not only learn the most recent paradigm in AI, but also learn how to use it and produce a thesis on it in under 100 days? Now, in retrospect, that does sound crazy, but those are the expectations that I had set for myself. So, to no one's surprise but my own, I yet again found myself picking away at a very difficult role, trapped in that cycle of frustration and discouragement. Not knowing where to start, I sought my professor out for guidance. He suggested I looked at precedents, others that have used art and AI already to see what tools they use and to build from there. Now at the time, there are only two widely known AI artists, and both of them use a tool called Generative Adversarial Networks, or GANs for short. Now this was a start, but it was only a shard, a fragment really. 
And with every article um, and term and video that followed, I was just pulling off one shard after the next. I needed to change my approach to avoid further frustrations. But I didn't know how. I had spent the last 20 years of my life being taught that I didn't know how to teach myself. It was through the process of learning how machines learn that I learned how I learn. And what I found for myself was, is that I learn by doing. So I put down the books, and I picked up a public software, one that would allow me to experiment with these generative networks. When machines were first realized, their objective was to perform quicker and more precisely than humans. Now, machines can not only learn, but create infinitely and in a matter of minutes. GANs learn by, GANs create by learning and reinterpreting data. They can be trained on data like images. GANs are composed of two competing neural networks that we can view as Tom and Jerry. Jerry is an art forger. Jerry wants to forge Picassos. Unfortunately, Jerry has no idea what a Picasso looks like, only that they're worth a lot of money. Tom is a detective. Tom is learning Picasso's work. His special assignment is to determine real Picassos from fakes. Jerry tries to sell his first attempts at creating Picassos. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're all just paintings of cheese. <laughs> Tom looks at these cheese paintings and goes, these do not look like any Picasso I've ever seen. These are fake. Unfortunately, Tom is also a blabbermouth, and he tells Jerry exactly why his paintings of cheese do not look like Picasso's. Realizing what he's done, Tom returns to his office to study Picasso's even better than before. Simultaneously, Jerry now knowing the differences between his cheese paintings that he produced and the Picasso paintings that Tom described, goes back and gives his forging another go. Every time Jerry tries to sell his forgeries, they look a little bit less like cheese and a little bit more like Picasso's. Tom studies hard to be the biggest expert in Picasso's there is, but his dang blabbermouth eventually lets Jerry surpass him. And soon, after about a few thousand cat and mouse chases later, Jerry can now forge Picasso's with ease, so much so that Tom can't tell the difference between the real ones and the fakes and neither can we. My new goal for my thesis was for Jerry to forge photorealistic images of cities. Using the public program, I trained Tom on images of cities that I photographed. Throughout the semester, I pushed Tom and Jerry through thousands of cat and mouse chases. And after each one, I learned something new about the networks. I was able to apply what I learned to the program to better improve Jerry's forgery skills, to help Tom learn how to learn. And as the semester progressed, Jerry's images looked a little bit less like cheese and a little bit more like cities. For weeks, I tugged and tugged away at these experiments, ripping off and throwing away every piece that twisted in on itself. Now, what I did not expect is how quickly the semester was coming to an end. And though Tom and Jerry were progressing, they weren't fast enough, and certainly not to my expectations. I feared the worst, that once again, I would have to admit to myself and to my peers that I couldn't do it in time, that I failed. Desperate for just one successful attempt, I pushed Tom and Jerry through their longest, most well-informed cat and mouse chase yet. And as I observed the output of Jerry's images, something unexpected started to unfold. Jerry's work started to regress. I was astonished. The machine was frustrated. The machine was giving up. 
I had set my expectations so high that I could not provide it with the right resources for it to succeed. I felt bad. I felt responsible. I wanted to console the machine and, and tell it that, you know, it's okay, that, that struggling is just part of learning. I wanted the machine to know that what it produced so far was actually kind of cool. That just because it couldn't meet my expectations does not mean that it failed. In fact, not only did the machine not reach my expectations, it actually exceeded them. I had been so focused on the outcome of the machine behaving as a supercomputer that I had neglected the process of the machine behaving as a human. The abstract nature of these images exudes humanity, a concept that is still being debated by professionals in the field today. The machine and I learned together. We struggled together. We grew frustrated together. But it was in recognition of the machine's desire to give up together that I had to ask myself. If I could forgive and love the machine for what it produced, then why couldn't I love the part of myself that produced it? I want to tell you all that I adopted this mentality overnight, but the truth is, every time I deliver that last line, I cry. It is easy to love others, but it is incredibly difficult to love yourself. My frustrations when using tape or packing boxes or completing a thesis are focused just as much towards myself as they are the task. I have been so focused on the outcome of myself behaving as a supercomputer that I have neglected the process of myself behaving as a human. But in the last year, since accepting that humanity, I have found a confidence within myself that has allowed me to start and finish any role that I have desired. Now, I mentioned earlier that by my third year of architecture school, I had grown exhausted. What I didn't mention is that at the time, my doctors told me if I didn't change my lifestyle, I would need to use a cane to walk by the age of 25. Well, I turned 25 next week. And last night, I broke my personal record deadlifting at the gym. In the last year alone, I have dedicated myself to a gym. I have landed and I work my dream job. I've traveled to Malawi to present my personal work to the Ministry of Health. And I'm currently giving a TED Talk. Thank you. I won't lie, I, I still don't know how to start things. I still get very frustrated. I still set my expectations way too high. But the difference now is that I know it's going to be okay because I'm only human. And everyone else, all of you are only human. And we're all always learning. And yeah, there might be others that use tape better than you or reach their goals quicker. But there is beauty and success to be found in our struggle, to be found in the unexpected. So I want all of you here to go home tonight, and I want you to find that role that you've been avoiding for the last five years. And I want you to pick. I want you to feel that frustration. And I want you to say, it's OK. I'm not a supercomputer. I'm not even a machine. And, and machines make mistakes, too. I'm only human. 
And I want you to practice this every time you start something new or pick up where you left off, no matter the difficulty. And I want you to remember, it is not only about learning how to learn, it is about loving yourself while you do. Thank you.